Good morning, Every Nation Ramesh. Today we are continuing our Exodus series. Remember last week we spoke from Exodus 1 and 2. Andrew preached from Exodus 1 and 2. And he spoke about how in life's hardest situation, there is always a but God. That in life, when tough times come, we can expect a but God moment. He talked about the big buts of life. How God intervenes in our difficult circumstances. He makes the difference that we can have an expectation of God's goodness in every kind of life event. Today we continue with Exodus 3. If you're reading along in your reading plan, I hope you've read Exodus 3 and 4. Perhaps you haven't read that, but don't worry, you can just get to it now. I am trusting that a revelation of Jesus and a revelation of God's goodness would come to you as I preach. Lord, I pray that today everyone watching this video would have an encounter with you. I pray they would hear more than my words, but they would hear your words. They would hear you speaking to their hearts. Lord God, set us free to be more like you because of what we hear today. So we are going to be looking at Exodus 3, 1 through 14. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open there. This story opens with Moses. You remember from last week, Moses was uh, threatened to be killed because Egypt was waging a war basically on Israel and was exterminating the children. And Moses' mother managed to hide him in a small basket in the river Nile. And he was found by Pharaoh's daughter and he was raised in Pharaoh's household. And he spent 40 years learning the ways of Egypt. And then he had an unfortunate, unfortunate, well, unfortunate is not the right word because he chose it, but he, he stepped out and did something that was wrong, ungodly. He ended up murdering an Egyptian man out of his own zeal for his people, but nonetheless he murdered the man. And he had to flee Egypt and he spent 40 years in Midian, in the wilderness, learning the ways of the wilderness, purposefully or per profoundly, should I say rather, profoundly positioning himself to lead Israel out of Egypt. We take up the story where he is still in Midian. He is married, he has children, and he is tending his father-in-law's sheep. We pick up the story there. Before I do that, I want to give you a little bit of kind of biblical background to that. After Genesis 1 to 3, this chapter of the Bible, Exodus 3 is probably one of the most profound and defining chapters of the Bible. In this particular passage, God defines himself to Moses, but in so doing, he also defines Moses to himself. And in, in defining Moses, he really defines all of mankind. And we can see in this chapter a definition of God and a definition of ourselves as we read it. The Bible is a self-revelation or the self-revelation of God to us. As we read the Bible, the primary thing we should be getting out of it is not how to be a better person or how to live a better life, but who God is, what his purposes are, what his character is. We learn from the Bible who God is and how everything about life flows out from that knowledge. Knowing God or the knowledge of God enlightens all knowledge. If he's God, then all knowledge fits into his story in some way. And knowing him allows us to know truth wherever it's found. Psalm 36 verse 9 says a profound thing. It says this, For with you, with you God, is the fountain of life. And in your light, we see light. The more we know about God, the more we know about ourselves. And the more we know about God, the more we know about life. This is the reason I love studying this passage, because it reveals God in such a profound way. And in that revelation, our capacity to know ourselves and to know life increases. So let's start with the story. The story begins in verse 1 this way. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came 
to Horeb, the mountain of God, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. I want to look at four ways that God reveals himself in Exodus 3, 1 through 14. The first way that we read in this small portion that we have just read is that God appears as fire. There's a revelation of God being a fiery God. Why does God use fire? Well, throughout the Bible, God represents himself as fire. We know that as the Israelites, excuse me, traveled through the wilderness, there was a pillar of fire that went with them that shone at night. When John the Baptist was talking of Jesus, he said that Jesus would come and baptize us in the Holy Spirit and fire. Deuteronomy 4.24 says this, that God is a consuming fire. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples in Acts 2, it says that the Holy Spirit appeared on them like tongues of fire. God, to some degree, is like fire. Fire is both terrifying and comforting. It's dangerous and life-giving at the same time. Who doesn't want to sit around a comforting fire in a lounge on a cold winter's day? At the same time, no one wants their house burning up under a gigantic fire. Fire is both terrifying and comforting. God, in the same way, is both terrifying and comforting. The Bible uses two definitive statements to describe God. It says that God is love and God is holy. God is loving, kind, comforting. He's drawing us to him. He's reaching out to us. He's extending goodness and life to us consistently. But God is also holy. He's awesome, majestic, powerful, absolutely perfect, cannot stand anything but perfection and goodness in his presence. God, how does this apply to us? Well, God is both, both holy and he's both love and he's love. If you, if you have a God who is not terrifyingly powerful and holy, but he is close and personal, then you have nothing more than an imagining, imaginary friend who's incompetent and impotent. We all need a powerful God. We all need a powerful God. If, on the other hand, your God is terrifyingly powerful and holy, but not loving and close and drawing to you, then you are hopelessly doomed. Why? Because there is this high standard of God's holiness that we have no way of reaching and we don't have any help to do it. We don't have a near God that helps us to reach that standard. But the beauty of what the Bible reveals about God and what we can see in God revealing himself is in fire is that he's both holy and both love and love. He's kind, reaching, helpful, um, empowering to you, and he is majestic, powerful, sovereign over all the earth. He's both of those things, and that should comfort your soul. We show the fire of God, the fiery nature of God to the world through our loving obedience. John 14 verse 15 says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Romans 11 verse 22 says this, Consider the kindness and the severity of God. We live both in the love of God and the fear of God. We have a powerful God who is holy and majestic but also close and intimate. The second way that God reveals himself in this portion of scripture starts in verse 5. We'll read there. Then he said, God said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then God said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt 
and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. The main part I want you to see in that passage is that God said to Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is a covenant keeping God. God will be faithful to his covenant. As I said two weeks back, he made a covenant with you and me way back through Abraham, but he also has made a covenant with us through Jesus Christ and he sealed that covenant in his very own blood. He guarantees that covenant through his righteousness and he will be true to that covenant to bring you into righteousness, to bring you into his presence, to heal you, to make you fully human, to restore you to the way you were meant to do, to heal, deliver, redeem the broken parts of your life and to bring you into the fullness of his purposes for you. And not only that, but to restore all of the earth through the covenant that he made with mankind and with the earth in Jesus Christ, his kingdom was initiated through that covenant and he will be true to that covenant. He is a covenant keeping God as he revealed himself to Moses as that so he is revealing himself to us through this passage as a covenant keeping God. Now, some years back, my daughter used to do ballet and she finished at a particular time of the day and she said to me one day, mom, please don't be late picking me up today. And I said, of course, Kay, I will be there on time. I had every intention of being there on time. But just before I left, the dog threw up on the carpet. I had to deal with that. Someone called me, one of my other children, and needed something urgently. So I got into the car late and I thought, never mind, I'll just put my foot a bit heavier on that accelerator. I'll still make it. On the way, there was an accident and the traffic was terrible. So it ended up, despite my best intentions, that I couldn't keep my word. I had told her I would be there on time and yet I could not keep my word. Why? Because as a fallible human being, I'm not in control of my environment. Things happen outside of my control. And sometimes that stops me from keeping my word. God, on the other hand, is completely different. God is control in control of everything. He is sovereign over all the earth, over all circumstances. He can keep his word 100%. There is nothing that will ever interfere with him being true to his words to you. There will never be anything that can stop him from keeping his covenants with us. God is a covenant keeping God as he was true to Israel. So he will be true to you and he will be true to me. We can trust him because he's faithful and powerful. He's powerful enough to do what he says and he will do that. He will do and keep his word. We show his covenant keeping nature to the world through our peace and trust. In other words, if God is going to do what he said he was going to do, then we can trust him. Then we can be at peace in our own hearts. That means that even when circumstances go wrong, when even things are out of our control, we can trust in a God for whom everything is in control. Where he, he is sovereign over all things and we can trust in his promises to us so we can live in peace. We show forth his covenant keeping nature to the world through our peace and trust. Psalm 46 verse 10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. In other words, when we are still and we know that the Lord is God and that he's a covenant keeping God and that he, he will be true to us and he will be faithful no matter what, no matter what the circumstances, there's always a God but. There's always a but God that is going to intervene to bring about his purposes. When we trust in that, then it speaks of his goodness to the world and he is exalted in the nations and he's exalted in the earth and all the nations and the earth see his goodness through our peace and trust in him. The next way that God reveals to us starts in verse 10. It goes like this. 
Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Moses asked him a question, and God answered a completely different question. Did you notice that? God, Moses asks... Who am I that I should go? In other words, Moses was doubting his own ability. He was like, who am I? What about me makes me able to do this great job that you've asked me? And God answers a completely different question. How is that about God? It's a characteristic I find all the time is that he he answers what you really need to know, not what you think you need to know. The point of this portion of scripture is that God reveals himself as the God who is with us. God with us. He answers Moses' question by telling him not who Moses is, but that God, I, will be with you. In other words, it's not your ability that's going to get you through this. It doesn't even matter who you are, really. It simply matters that God is with you. Think about this. Moses' moral integrity wasn't great. I've already told you that the reason he was in the wilderness in the first place is that he fled Egypt because he had killed an Egyptian. He had taken matters into his own hands to try and rescue Israel and failed completely. God was saying, despite the fact that your moral integrity isn't intact, despite the fact that you are flawed and broken, because I am with you, you will succeed. It wasn't because of Moses' moral integrity that the Exodus succeeded. It was because of God's moral integrity and because God was with Moses. Some time back, we had a legal challenge against our church. Someone was wanting to sue us for a large sum of money. I had to go into a negotiation with this party and As I was getting ready to go in, I felt absolutely confident. Why did I feel confident? Not because I'm super smart at legal matters, but because I remembered when we drafted the contract in the first place, I had had a super smart lawyer sit with us and help us draft it. I also knew that every step of the way that we'd engaged in this contract, this super smart lawyer had been informing us and helping us. So I knew that we had a watertight case. When I sat before this this other party and we began in negotiations, by the end of the time, they were saying things like to me, oh, I'm so sorry, we we didn't see it that way. Yes, you're right, yes, everything's in order. And they left there thinking that we were marvelous and totally reconciled to us and withdrawing their legal case, not because of my great legal wisdom, but because of who was with me. So it is in our life, is that it's not about your super great abilities, your wisdom, your endless, genius. It's about the fact that God is with us. When we ask God the question, who am I? His answer is this, I am with you, which leads me to a kind of a a sub point of this is that your definition is not primarily your, your, or let me put it this way. Your identity is not what you do. It is not about your sexual preference, it's not about your race, it's not whether you're wealthy or poor, it's not even about your nationality. Your identity is determined by the fact that God is with you or God is not with you. This is the primary undergirding of your identity. The things I mentioned are are, are important to some extent, but they're not the most important thing. The most important thing about you is whether God is with you or not. The most, the greatest determiner of your success in life is not your skills, your ability, who you are, where you were born, your gender, your race. It's whether God is with you or not. The Holy Spirit is God with us today. Never has there been a time in history when God was more with us than he is with us now. He is with us as the fire of the fiery presence of the Holy Spirit speaking to us, leading to us, leading us. When he's with us, when when we are people of his presence, people of the Holy Spirit, and he's with you in the form of the Holy Spirit, then 
Out of that comes this identity. You are a son or daughter of the Most High God. You are loved, you are chosen, and you are called to go as Moses was. Who am I, you might ask God, to do the things that I have been called to do or that I feel in my heart? His answer to you is, I am with you. I am with you. Acts 4 verse 13 says this, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. This particular scripture is written at a time when Peter and John were being called to give account of their faith in a very animistic ex experience. And, and the people who were antagonistic and angry towards Peter and John, it says they were astonished. They, they knew these were unschooled and ordinary men, but they were amazed at their wisdom and their insight and their eloquence. And they took note that they had been with Jesus. Jesus is with us today in the form of the Holy Spirit. And as we face those kind of circumstances that Peter and John faced, we can rest assured that God with us in the form of the Holy Spirit will cause people to marvel at our courage, marvel and be astonished and note that we are people of God's presence. We tell the world who we are by demonstrating a life that shows Jesus is with us, a life on fire with the Holy Spirit. The last way that I want to highlight from this portion of scripture about how God reveals himself there, there are many different ways. I just chose four that I thought were the most relevant to us. It starts in verse 13 and it says this, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I don't know what you feel about that. If you ask someone their, na their name and they say, I am, I am that I am, you're going to think the man or the woman that you're speaking to has gone Looney Tunes. Why? Because I am is not a name. It, it doesn't sound like a name. But here God announces himself as the great I am. In Hebrew, the word is Yahweh or Jehovah. It's often written. But he, he he comes and announces himself by this name. Interestingly enough, up to this point, later on we learn in Exodus, up to this point, God had only been known by the name El Shaddai or Elohim. And this was the first time he revealed himself by almost his personal name. He kind of unveiled himself and said, this is who I am. I am that I am. This is Yahweh. Now, when you hear the phrase, I am, and you think about what the word should be that comes after I am, you always think it should become some kind of adjective, a descriptive word, or maybe a name. I am Carol. I am Fost. I am an engineer. I am happy. You always think it's either a name or a description. God purposefully didn't say that or put anything after it. Why? Because he was saying, there is nothing by which I can be defined. In turn, I define everything. He didn't put a particular name or title in the end because he could not be defined by anyone. He can't be defined by anyone or anything. In turn, he defines all things, all physical realities. He is the definer of all things. God as he reveals himself as Yahweh, I am that I am, is stating in this way of revealing himself that he's all sufficient and he is self-sufficient. In other words, he doesn't need anything to complete him. Practically for us, that has astounding applications. It means that God doesn't need your money. It means that God doesn't need your worship. It means that God doesn't need your good works. Astounding. And yet he still asks for them. He asks you to tithe. He asks you to worship. 
He asks you to do good works. Why does he ask these things? Not for himself. God is all sufficient. He needs nothing for you, from you. He doesn't ask for himself. He asks for you. God doesn't need you, but he wants you. He loves you. And part of that love means that he asks you to do something that won't help him, but that will help you. When we obey him with our tithes, with our worship, with our obedience, with our good works, when we obey him in those things, we become free. We become fully human. We become like him and we begin to fulfill our purpose as we show to the world the image of God, his generosity, his his passions, his life, his goodness. We become more like him in doing the things he asks us to do. And in so doing, we become more fully human, more fully alive and freer than we've ever been. Interestingly enough, Jesus was having an argument with the, with the Jews at one time. And he made this, they were saying, how old are you? You could never have known Abraham because he'd mentioned something about Abraham. In John 8 verse 58, he then made the statement, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. <laughs> Don't you love it? Here were Jews who were steeped in this idea of Yahweh. I am that I am. The great I am. God who calls himself. I am. And Jesus stood in front of them, looked them straight in the eye and said, here is that Yahweh that you worship. Before Abraham was born, I am. He named himself by the name of God, the personal powerful, special name of God that had been revealed to Moses all those years back. Jesus was declaring the God of the universe has stepped down and he has come to find you. He has come to find me, he has come to find us. Yahweh is here in the form of Jesus Christ. We acknowledge him as Yahweh by allowing him to be sovereign over all, by allowing him to define our world, to, by allowing him to tell us what is right and wrong, by allowing him to define us and our world. In conclusion, as we looked at these four ways that God reveals himself as followers of Jesus, the great I am. We reveal his fire to the world by our loving obedience. We show him as covenant keeper to the world through our peace and trust. We tell the world who we are by demonstrating a life that shows God with us, a life on fire with the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge him as Yahweh by allowing him to define us and our world. We are defined by his presence and we show him to the world by his presence in us. Lord, I pray for everyone watching this. Lord God, that as Moses has a, that encounter with you on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, Lord God, I ask that, that everyone would have ongoing encounters with you, the great I am, the fire, the passion of your life would come to us, Lord God, and that in everything we would come to know God with us. We would come to know you as a covenant-keeping God. We would come to know you as the one who defines all things and we would find joy and peace and life in that. And in so doing, we'd become fully human, fully ourselves, fully alive, fully free. God bless you. May the Lord be with you. Don't forget to join a group, lead a group, or journey with a group. As we continue through the book of Exodus, so many great adventures and lessons and learnings to happen. Don't miss out on that. Find a group that you can process these things with and walk with them as we uncover the secrets and the truths and the beauty of God in Exodus. God bless you.